Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Paul Clement Hunt. Uh, so I am your master of ceremonies for the past two days, and I've been asked to reflect on day one. Okay, so we'll, I've got about 15 minutes. We're running 15 minutes late, but let me start the day like this. We've had 14 signatories, 14 mers have signed the Gazian de de Declaration. That is a great start. But if you're a mayor who can sign, and you're serious, go and sign the declaration. That's a plea. That's going to the Global Refugee Forum in Geneva in the middle of December. And we, th we believe it's a, it's a good declaration. Second point is, I'm not sure if he's in the room, but I'd like to welcome um, Mayor Harold Tucker, who's flown in overnight from Sierra Leone, from Bow City. Again, I'm not sure if you're in the room, but we should... Oh. Mayor, Tu Mayor Tucker, welcome. How was the flight? Good. We're really delighted to see you, and thank you for, for, for flying in. That's... That was very good clapping from the front row, but not the rest. I want it again. Let's welcome Mayor Tucker properly. Okay. Fasten your seats, because this is going to be Formula One, all right? Because yesterday was a huge day. We covered incredible amounts of ground, and hopefully this slide thing is going to work. Went the wrong way. I'm going to come back to that image. Look at it for 20 seconds. A lot of you will have seen it, but come back to that image. We'll come back, all right? Take the image on board. This is what I call, who in the room is in their 40s? Who's in their 50s? Who's in their 60s? Okay. Anyone, I guess, in their 40s, 50s, maybe 40s, 50s, will recognize this as a 4 a.m. map. It's that moment you wake up. And whether it's personal or professional, you look at the clock and you go, it's 4 o'clock, and all the thoughts start crowding in, the problems, the challenges, the children. The w this is my 4 a.m. map from last night. Okay, And the reason it's my 4 a.m. map is that I reflected on... Uh, does anyone recognize that moment, by the way, the 4 a.m. wake up? You don't have to put your hand up, but I want some connection in the audience. There's a few nods. Good. All right. The day was so rich. We went from the vice president of Turkey through a range of mayors. We went through... We had Colombia. We had uh, Syria. We had Turkey. We had... Australia, we had an incredibly rich day across policy, across finance, across refugees, across a whole range of issues. It's impossible to summarize a day as rich as that, but this is what I want to do, and I want you as the audience to work. Is that clear? This is a simple map which goes from hope for refugees to despair. You go from policy chaos to policy cohesion. Anyone who presented yesterday, or anybody who's involved in a project or an initiative with refugees, I would hope that you can place your project somewhere in one of those quadrants, okay? And you certainly do not want to be in the quadrant where you have, no polit you have a political wall rather than political will, you have financial absence, you don't have any resources, and you have policy chaos. Would people agree that's the worst place to be? Could we have coffee for the whole audience, please? Do people agree that's the worst place you could possibly be? Yes, good. Whereas if you have financial resources, you have policy cohesion and political will, you are going to make things happen. So I want everybody involved, whatever your project, your primary project is, to think now where you exist in those quadrants. What's the positive and what's the problem? And that's what we need to do. Because you know what we need to do? We need to take the Gaziantep Declaration and we need to drive it to the heart of the policy process. And that starts in Geneva. Claudio from UNDP, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Right. So what you've got to do is look at the quadrant and place where UNDP are in that in terms of helping refugees. I'm not going to ask you to speak about it, but I've asked the whole audience to do it. It's simple. The things that I'm taking from yesterday, it's obvious, 71 million refugees, incredibly 15, 50% 50 under 15, as I understand it, there is a global policy revolution, which is great, but are the resources to back it up? Is there the political will to back it up? These are the questions that we had yesterday. Would anyone disagree with that? No, good, so we move on. The drivers 
are not going to go away. Conflict, security issues, fractious politics around the world, climate issues, water-connected, resource degradation. My, just a footnote on myself, my only real, I suppose, credibility to talk about refugees is that for the last four years, I've headed up a, a large French NGO, or at least their international board. We work on food security and nutrition in the Sahel. So from Senegal to Djibouti, the 11 countries. It's food sec security and nutrition. Those range of issues are absolutely central to what we do. The Sahel, by 2050, will have 300, 300 million people, 75% of which will be under 20. There are not many sustainable livelihoods. The Sahel has a very positive story, but it has a very negative one as well. And the number of refugees, those young refugees heading north, are the people we deal with and meet through 1,500 communities in the Sahel. That's where I became involved. That's the personal point. I want to move on now to the policy revolution. Who is this lady? Well, this lady is a Nigerian engineer, former environment minister, and Amina J. Mohammed has driven, with the Secretary General's backing, the idea that we really have to localize solutions around the SDGs. And that is quite a leap for the UN, which, as we all know, is a body that works at the sovereign level with sovereign governments. So there is political risk in that process, I believe. And I should admit, I was a UN official from 2000 to 2012. So um, I wouldn't have been saying these things then, but as a private individual with my own very small company, I can say it now, and I hope it will help the discussion. So again, the point around the policy revolution is you're all aware of it. All of the acronyms, all of the declarations, it's incredible stuff. There's incredible initiatives. But I come back to the point, Claudia, I'm going to keep coming to you as the head of UNDP. And I don't want you to answer, but I'm planting questions. What about the resources? What about the finance? What about the investment? Is that stacking up? Is the political will there to make these initiatives real? Whether it's whichever part of the world. That's a fundamental question for this audience. And if it is, great. If it isn't, which I'm sure is the case, how do we take the Gaziantep Declaration into Geneva and drive those issues to secure the will and the resources to begin delivering some of the solutions we heard about yesterday at scale? Again, does anyone disagree with this? OK, so these are my reflections on yesterday. Let's move on from Amina J. Mohammed. I think I've gone the wrong way. Back to this image. There was a lot of complexity in the discussion yesterday. There was a lot of complexity and there was some ambiguity. I don't think this image is that ambiguous. I would guess that this is an image which reflects part of the, the refugee pathway across the Mediterranean. Would most people agree? This image is not ambiguous. This image, that's ambiguous for me. Is that refugees or is that African traders in an overpacked lorry heading north to a market? I don't know. Maybe it's a mixture. I think what we were seeing yesterday as well, and, for, and forgive me for just the African images, that's because where my own personal concentration is. And, but I think these play out in a broader sense. So that's an ambiguous image. What we are not in any way in doubt about from yesterday's discussion, no, let me go back. OK, that's an ambiguous image. That, for the people who weren't here, was an incredible performance by a Turkish Syrian choir um, of children from Gaziantep. And it's the sounds of peace. People agree with me. It was a good special moment, right? It's beautiful. That's an ambiguous image because it's one of hope, and it's one of tremendous achievement. But I am guessing within that image, there are that combined stories of hope and despair in terms of individuals. You go back, every one of those individuals, there's a story, refugee or not, tradesperson or not. That one are individual stories. And I think that's where the complexity comes from yesterday's discussion, whether it was the examples from the mayor in Gaziantep, 
or is our friend in Colombia, or the transit center in Serbia, and forgive me for not naming individuals, we've got layers of complexity, from the policy, through the social inclusion and relations, through to the technical issues, through the finance, huge complexity. This is not ambiguous, and I didn't use the image, and I won't, because all of us know it so well. But the mayor in Gaziantep referred to the fact that anyone involved in this space, babies shouldn't be dying on beaches. And that's a very unambiguous point. And that centers us and grounds us in the context that we have to move and we have to get results. Why have I put shoes at the top there? And it's, it's a, it's a, who in the room, and I do want to show, who's got children? Okay. I would guess most people in the room who've got children recognize that moment, which is usually rushed. It's typically, it's typically the mother, but not always. When you take a three-year-old or a four-year-old and you put their shoes on, do you recognize that moment, right? What struck me about that image three years ago was the, the child they found on the beach, which, again, everybody knows about the image, was his shoes. It were those typical little trainers that you put on a three-year-old, the Velcro strap, and they will have been put on that moment, in that morning in hope. And I go back to the original diagram, hope and despair. And for me, the point made by the mayor here in Gaziantep was so fundamental that that morning for a refugee and the family, it starts in hope and aspiration and ends in utter despair. What can we do to reduce that at speed and at scale? That's just a question for all of us, okay? So I don't want to dwell too long on that, but that's unambiguous. And that was one of my takeaways that simplified yesterday. The mayor of Gaziantep, fantastic presentation and referencing that. It's unambiguous. We have to act, we know that. So back to the hope, despair. Have you had a chance to think where your project sits in which quadrant? And how can the Gaziantep Declaration and more resources and donor backing assist that? Let me move on because the clock is ticking. I'm going to pick the registered with me two moments, and there's a connection here. So, again, the mayor in Gaziantep, as well as making the very emotive point about children, made the point about budget, budget, budget. If you don't have budget or backing, nothing happens. It's almost so self-evident, it's not worth saying, but the mayor said it, and that registered very, very clearly. Another one I've picked out, we have two Australians here, Gordon Noble and Tony Doyle. I know 36 hours of travel, economy class, not saying anything, it's all right, it's fine. But some of the work that was flagged in one of the panel sessions is this idea around resources and budget, that typically so much of the refugee response is at the philanthropic, the donor, the foundation end. But we are not and have not mobilized really any private capital towards it. So it's a huge question, can that be done? Can that be done? Can those resources be opened up? And again, I'm doing this in a self-serving way because that was my takeaway and the, the way I see problems is often through a financial lens. The late, great Kofi Annan. Bit of an unusual image. What's he doing? Does anyone know what he's doing? So he's opening the American markets at the New York Stock Exchange. And on the balcony with him there were basically pension funds. And on the day that that was launched in 2006, there was $4 trillion. And it was a bit of a risk, because we didn't know whether the traders on the New York Stock Exchange floor would know who Kofi Annan was, or if they did, whether they'd boo him. We just didn't know. But it worked like a dream. 13 years on, that initiative basically is now $80 trillion 2,500 institutions aligned with UN values and goals. So it's the deepest pools of capital aligned with UN values and goals. 
I think, Claudia, I'm speaking to you, and I'm speaking to other UN friends, I think there is a possibility and a chance to use that interaction that the UN has moved to look at different ways of financing, okay? Because that's what's needed at scale. Let's finish off now. Um, again, lots of different thoughts for me, and it's my personal reflection. I've got six seconds left. Um, it was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. That, to me, speaks to the refugee situation for so many individuals. And that was written in 1859 by Charles Dickens, and it was about the French Revolution. So again, a time when the world was great volatility and movement of people. So again, it's just a personal reflection. To finish, you certainly don't want to see me. Um, to finish, it was such a rich discussion. And Andres, right, you've joined us from Germany, and I should have given you the same thanks. Um, it was a very rich discussion, it was complex, but it was a lot of personal stories, which were, there maybe have been 50 or 60 personal stories told. But my takeaway was that unless you have the policy cohesion, unless you have the financial resources, unless the fantastic UN family, UNDP, UNHCR, IOM, UNICEF, all of the acronyms, unless they are effectively resourced and backed politically, it's very difficult for them to move. That was the message that came across. What Turkey has done in terms of four million refugees, and which the vice president reminded us, there's clear policy cohesion, and also when you link it to the local level, not just the Gaziantep mayor, but the other mayors, what has been achieved here is remarkable in terms of the process since 2014. So, those are my comments, those are my reflections. I encourage you not just to sign the Gaziantep Declaration and move on. UCLG, Mewa, Middle East and Western Africa, have created a global task force which they're looking for membership, and that's to drive the Gaziantep Declaration. So let's do that. Let's think about finance. Let's think about resources. Let's think about some of the innovative thinking that we're seeing out of Australia, whether it's a Get Started Fund for coast com host communities and refugees. But innovation in resources will be really important. I will stop there, and I will go to my housekeeping mode, and then we'll get on with the first session. So that presentation is finished. I hope it was stimulating in at least some way. So a couple of housekeeping points before we go to the first session. Um, the, the municipality of Gaziantep uh, have added a feedback survey to the app that you have for the event. If you could take the time to fill it in, that would be greatly appreciated by the mayor and the team at uh, Gazi and Tap, who gave us such a wonderful night last night, the gala dinner. I'm breaking my own rules here. We have to stick to time, 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 because many people are taking flights early evening. So for the moderators of each session, um, We've started a little bit late. I've taken a bit of time, but we'll move on. But let's try and stick to time. And speakers, we'd appreciate it if you receive, um, uh, uh, respect that. Um, you will have a report of this conference, proceedings by the end of the year. And one last final thing is the moderators for the three parallel sessions, which take place later in the morning, we'd like you to meet at 11.10 hours. So we have three parallel sessions. Meet at 11.10 hours in the bilateral room uh, one level up. Um, I will now ask the moderator of the first plenary session this morning. So that's uh, Salim Korkmaz, who's the general coordinator, UCLG, Mewa, to come to the stage. The podium is yours. Please invite your guests and uh, have a good session. Thank you. Distinguished participants, welcome to the first session of the second day of the forum. As Paul has just summarized, there's been a very fruitful first day. We, had, we, we were able to discuss a lot of issues in relation to migration and migration management and how local governments can contribute to this challenge. Before we proceed with the uh, session, of course, I would like to invite our distinguished uh, panelists for this session. We have a large panel of six mayors and experts. So I would like to invite Mr. Antonio Rodriguez Osuna, the mayor of Merida from Spain, 
and Andreas Holstein, Mayor of Altena from Germany, and Mr. Zinnur Büyüköz, Mayor of Gebze from Turkey, and Mr. Murat, Murat Çalık, Mayor of Beylikdüzü from Turkey again, and Mr. Burak Oğuz, Mayor of Urla from Izmir, Turkey, and Ms. Firdaus Osidium, the co coordinator of UCLG Intermediary Cities Forum. So before we start our panel, uh, panel discussion, I would like to briefly introduce wh what our panel is about and what we are going to give a, an idea of. So this session will be focusing on how small and intermediary cities can contribute to migration management within the framework of the, uh, of the, fr of the local governance uh, and local governance, local governance and also uh, nationwide governance. How small and intermediary cities can contribute, and what, uh, what possibilities do they have? So we all know what small cities are, even if the definition may depend on the country, uh, from country to country. Uh, there are smaller cities in relation to the larger cities, but the definition of intermediary cities may not be that clear, so maybe I would like to briefly inform you what we, we mean by intermediary cities, but not intermediate cities. So what we mean by intermediary is that they have an intermediary role in terms, of the, in, ter in terms of the relation to the rural areas and metropolitan areas. So they are neither rural nor metropolit metropolitan areas, but they can connect to both. So this gives intermediary cities a unique opportunity to, uh, to connect to the rural people as well as the metropolitan uh, cities. And these kind of cities have another role in terms of migration management that we will uh, elaborate more. Be because of their sizes, they have some advantages and they also have some disadvantages. They have some challenges as well. We will talk about that. And in terms of territorial governance, as I said also, they have a special role because they, they need to connect to the uh, administration at the rural level as well as the metropolitan level and of course at the national level as well. So we will focus on this unique role and how this role can contribute to migration management efforts. Uh, this intermediary cities agenda in particular had, had a past of course. We have been this working with United States and local governments, uh, General Secretariat in Barcelona, particularly Ms. Frida Sosidium who will will be also speaking at the end of this session. Uh, this agenda produced two major documents for us. One of them was the Nevshire Declaration on Intermediary Cities in 2017. And uh, also there was a, a Declaration Charter of Intermediary Cities of the World in 2018 in Shafshavan, Morocco. So we will be also briefly discussing these two documents and how they relate to migration management. So before... Uh, I don't want to take so much time, so we can immediately start with the first speaker, Mayor of Merida, Mr. Antonio Rodriguez Osuna. As a mayor of a Spanish city of 60,000 population, how, he will briefly inform us about how uh, they manage migration flows in their city and what kind of migration flows do you have. And yeah, we will listen to you for like eight minutes maximum, and then we will be discussing on your comments later. Please. Muchas gracias, buenos días a, a todas y a todos. Me van a disculpar que, que hable en español precisamente para poder eh, expresar eh, con más corrección aquello que me gustaría trasladar hoy aquí. Now, as said before by the chair of the session, as the master of ceremony or session moderator said, Merida has a population of 60,000 and it is an interior city, a small size city. And to have an idea about the location of the city, think of a triangle and it's at the heart of, on one side you have Lisboa, on other side Sevilla, and on other side you have Madrid and it's at the center of uh, that triangle. And it's not a uh, shore city, it's not close to sea, inland city. And with the Spanish government, we have a significant cooperation 
the autonomous capital. It is an autonomous capital. And in addition to being an autonomous capital, to solve the migration problems, uh, it is the city that transfers most of the resources for solving problems. First, I would like to say local contributions are very important. We came to power uh, at five years ago, and it was very clear in our mind that this migration issue cannot be tackled only at global or national level, but we should address it at local level as well to find a solution to migration problems. And we created a unique uh, system. We established a delegation, a cooperation delegation. And many of the municipalities in Spain don't have this type of delegations to transfer the funds. And we need to make policies, create policies. And these policies can be created and implemented only with economic resources. And there is no legal requirement for such a delegation or such a support or such cooperation with the central Spanish government. The Spanish government leaves it to the will of the state governments, autonomous governments. It is not mandatory. And our cooperation is very high level recently at political level for making the migration policy operational. Our city, Merida, is a region that receives migration in 1950s. When I came, there was 50 percent. We had a migration of 50 percent from other European countries. And interestingly, we had migration from Africa, from Morocco especially. In that period, because of the civil conflicts and the poverty, people fled from their um, country of origins. And we had that migration in Merida. 50 percent of our city's population are migrants. At first glance, at first, we already know what type of challenges these migrant people have. Therefore, we established this delegation, and we decided to transfer funds to this delegation. We have established a center to provide services to the migrants. It has a capacity of 2,800 African origin uh, from Guinea, from Mali, from Ivory Coast. Many migrants came, and 80% of these migrants passed through this migrant center. And 18% are minors under the age of 18 who hasn't completed the age of maturity. All these activities and works were conducted with local and regional resources with our own administrative budget. Additionally, our city has resources provided by the national government and 25% of migrants are from Venezuela and Colombia, from Latin America. And as administration of the city, we used all our available resources to welcome them, not just welcoming, but also implementing integration policies so that these people can integrate healthily in our country. We have developed policies to ensure that they fully integrate with the host community. We provide them with interpreting services, psychosocial support with social workers and psychologists. And these migrants, during the first years, they are accompanied by experts. And many of them don't have any information at all. They don't even know their national. They cannot even state their nationality, their age, because they can't basically speak the language. Oh, no. And many of these migrants come from overseas. They pass through oceans. These are people coming from faraway lands. Our city is a small city. And global solutions don't fit to local. And they cannot be implemented without the contribution of local authorities, local governments. 
If the small municipality received 2,800 migrants at the global scale for EU, for instance, if local governments take similar political measures for migrations and migrants, how many people could have such healthy conditions? We should scale up this. And it leads to a huge resource. The local governments need resources to conduct these activities, and they need to receive support from national government. And in EU, European Union, the quotas, the responsibility quotas of the relevant government, still ongoing discussions and consultations about the quotas of the countries for receiving the migrants. There is no unique strategy now, uniform strategy. There is only a will. And the governments who want to direct their funds have a will, but some governments even don't have that will to support, and they have no govern uh, migration policy at all. I'll conclude with final messages. Here, the opinions that will be reached finally is from any part of Spain, even if a rural, a remote part, village of Spain, the public policies for providing assistance and supporting the migrants and ensuring their integration, even a remote and the most smallest city, the remotest town can provide policies. Thank you. This is my message. Çok çok teşekkürler Sayın Başkan. Merida'nın katkıları önemliydi. Ulusal hükümet politikaların ulusal Thank you for these comments. And our second speaker will be Mr. Andreas Holstein from Altena, from Germany. Uh, we, as UCLG Mewa, we are also working with German municipalities in terms of migration management. We have organized some workshops and some uh, meetings to discuss what Turkish and German municipalities can do and how they can learn from each other. And it will be interesting for us and for the rest of our participants to hear about the German policies, first of all, because in Germany you have a very organized central government level migration policy, and what your city is doing, because you are also known as a very refugee and migrant friendly mayor, so we'd like to hear your comments on this. Please. Thank you. I will try to do it, uh, but first of all, let me mention that in my eyes, uh, migration is an individual thing. Uh, people are moving individual and uh, we can't bring solution on a global level or a national level. We have to be individual in our towns uh, and uh, to integrate them. But um, beside this, uh, let me take you on a journey. Uh, in Germany, we, we have migration since uh, hundreds of years, but uh, in the 60s, uh, through the industrial sector, we have had uh, migrants from Turkey, from Greece, and, Sp and Spain, and Italy, and we integrate them, integrated them very well, and today they are not seen as migrants and their families because we are inside the European Union, and uh, we feel uh, friends and uh, at home all together. But we did less to help them to integrate. So uh, there has to be a change in my eyes. And uh, even in the 90s, when we have had the European crisis of Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, and uh, many asylum seekers came to Germany, we learned nothing, really nothing. Uh, we have, of course, a quite good uh, bureaucracy system of uh, how to, to handle them if they are coming but uh, not integrating them. And in my little town, uh, located a little bit uh, south of Dortmund, uh, you probably know uh, because of football, today uh, they are playing against Barcelona, and uh, uh, 17,000 inhabitants, uh, it's an industrial town, and uh, we are doing quite a lot of work since uh, nine, 2007, 
uh, in participation of uh, our citizens. So um, from this first step, it developed 10 years or 12 years ago, and um, they developed um, in 2013 first language courses for asylum seekers and uh, a kind of social help on a volunteer base. It was nothing done by the town. We only gave the framework for participation in our town. And uh, it was 2014. I'm a little bit engaged in a group of German mayors who are busy to help our European friends in Greece because uh, we closed in uh, Europe our eyes uh, very hard, um, not looking for the burdens uh, who, which uh, are present in Greece and in Italy and a little bit less, but also in Spain. Uh, the Schengen Agreement uh, seems to be comfortable for the North and uh, at this time and in 2014 I was in Athens and spoke with the mayor colleagues of Lesbos, Samos, Idomeni. I don't have to mention more names, Kavala I can, could add. And I saw pictures I never saw in my life. I have four children and I never can even think about what will happen if my children are in such a situation like we saw in the image uh, before with the boat. But it was present and uh, these images are, were um, reality and uh, then I came back and said, okay, what we can do as a little, little puzzle piece uh, in the European game. I can't influence as a small mayor uh, the European Union. I can't influence uh, our global society but I can start with my population. And uh, I went to my political parties and said, I have a kind of idea, let us take 100 people more than we have to take. Because in German, everything is bureaucracy, of course. And we have to, to take asylum seekers uh, to a key uh, of inhabitants and economic uh, resources. And um, my idea was to take 100 more than we have had to take at this moment because I saw that the uh, participation process with the volunteers was very successful and they, they uh, developed tools on a basic way to help them to integrate and I said, okay, if we have the resources and we have uh, the, the human resources with the volunteers, let us uh, send a, a little, a very little, uh, sign of will to, 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 to the situation, which, uh, if you remember, 2015 was not very hopeful. Everyone in Germany was thinking uh, it's maybe the end. They are coming and uh, a big crisis and even mayors signed declarations. Uh, we need more money, uh, Chancellor Merkel. We will not uh, going on uh, friendly in our towns and we have rightists uh, coming more and more to power. And uh, then we decided, okay, we will take 100 refugees more than, than we have to, to take, and we integrated them. And uh, we, uh, how we did this uh, quickly, uh, we did it with a different approach to other cities, uh, even in Germany. We decentralized the housing, so every uh, asylum seekers got uh, every asylum seeker got uh, together with four or five other people a flat a normal flat they got normal neighbors uh, then we have had a godfather or godmother system uh, run by the volunteers so uh, every flat has a godfather or godmother taking care about the, the people and we saw this uh, system uh, worked and uh, at this time we were struggling in Germany to, 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 to widen up the possibilities of language courses but at this time we have had every week 14 courses run by volunteers, volunteers, pensioners, uh, pensioner uh, teachers who are willing to do something. 
And uh, because of this, uh, we were quite successful in, in, in integrating um, new citizens. We see them as new citizens. They have a special problem that causes uh, the move they did, but they have opportunities, they, have, uh, uh, they are rich, they bring, make us, our small community, richer than before. And until now, uh, this situation worked. It was not without problems, it was uh, with uh, uh, fire in a house of the asylum seekers in 2015, but these, all these barriers we took and today it's, um, it's friendly and today it's uh, more professional and uh, all together belongs to the people at the front, to the volunteers. And I think uh, if we like to, to, to build a new world, we need to, to bring our people, our citizens in and solutions are never global, are never national, they are local. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your speech. Thank you for your speech and for your excellent time management. Uh, I would like to stress one point, of course. You, as a mayor of a relatively smaller city, taking initiative to host more refugees than you're supposed to, it's really something important because it's not something that we hear very frequently. Uh, we will be talking about that more in later on during the discussion, but let me go to the next speaker. We won't be going by the order of seats, but our third speaker will be Mr. Zinur Bükos, Mayor of Gebze, Turkey. Gebze is a city of around 370,000 population, uh, so it may not be considered as a uh, small city in the Euro European context, but not in Turkish context as well, but we can con consider it as an intermediate, intermediate size city and also in, as an intermediary city in terms of its connection with Istanbul and the uh, Anatolian part of Turkey. So we'd like to hear Mr. Mayor about the policies Gebze has been implementing and what Gebze means for the migra migration flows, not only for the inter international migrants, but also for the domestic migration flows. Buyurun Başkan. Evet. Okay. I wish that this forum will yield fruitful results for our country and for all the world. And I wish my best, I extend my best wishes to the participants as Gebze municipality. Yes, we have 371,000 population, but we are hosting 34,000 Syrian. Uh, migrants and there are 10,000 other migrants of different nationalities from different parts of the world. A total of 44,000 migrant population in Gebze. This means I visited a school yesterday and out of 1,500 students, 320 are children of migrant families. That is to say 20% of the students belong to a migrant family. In other words, in 2018, 36,000 increase in population because of internal or domestic migration. The previous, pop and there is a great increase in population of Gebze due to migration. Briefly speaking, this means in one year, there is an increase of 7,200 7, students. And these students have education needs, health needs, and parks, and all other social needs. Considering uh, collectively a local government to increase all its service and its uh, transport and social needs and infrastructure to any percent all of a sudden in a single year. And how challenging it is that we have to accept this. Gebze is an industrial city, but it is also an intermediary city. We have 200,000 workforce. And out of this 200,000 workforce, it is attractive. And it attracts both domestic and international migration. Every morning, when you wake up, you come up with newcomers and new migrants and new potential. You, there is a potential for newcomers each and every day. Of course, there are challenges for managing this. 
But our greatest advantage is the local operations could be operational immediately, and we have direct contact with social solidarity NGOs, and our internal internal dynamics becomes operational without degrading them, without causing them sufferings. Somehow we provide accommodation and we host them. Despite this huge demand, today in the streets of Gebze, there is no homeless. There is no person living on the streets in Gebze. We have open door policy, and in the face of this open door policy, all migrants coming to Gebze with a sense of charity based on our values, our traditions, and charity, we take it as a responsibility and immediately, quickly, we provide accommodation to them and we provide sheltering and accommodation facilities to them. Another challenge is providing employment and education. As I said, in one school, 20% of the students are from migrant families, and you can think how challenging it is for social harmonization and integration and cultural harmonization. Challenges are unavoidable. But what we do here, we have direct consultations with these families, cultural dialogues with the families directly, face to face, and we try our best to integrate them to our community. From another perspective, as intermediary cities, people come from Anatolia to Gebze, and they stay there for a period of time, and later on, they develop their skills and they establish their network and they move on to Istanbul or other metropolitan cities. But this time, a skilled workforce and skilled and qualified human resource. And the, the disadvantage that they leave behind is in Gebze is all the time we have amateurs, so called the unskilled, unqualified population, migrant population. And we have to learn how to face with this reality. The improvement parameters about urbanization, we have challenges. Urbanization, becoming urban, and the culture, urban culture, we have challenges for establishing an urban culture there. Constantly, we have new cultures, new codes of behavior, new social fabrics, and we have try our best to prepare and adapt the infrastructure for that as local governments. While we have this struggle in Antalya, for instance, the summer population, they have a, a 10 or 20,000 uh, all around year population will increase up to 50,000. But their need is just sea, sun, some cultural needs, and some uh, accommodations and resource, but the population coming to Gebze is different. They don't stay just for a couple of days or a week. They start a life there and they have basic needs, education, health, culture, and social needs. All they bring together with them to urban area. Therefore, we believe that central government should have different financial flows to these intermediary cities. and. Institutional organizations should be tailor-made to address these needs of intermediary cities. And provincial directorate of migration management has been, district directorate of migration management has been established in Gebze. Uh, district Directorate of Migration Management established in 34 city, uh, districts, and one of them is Gebze. This is a correct and timely attitude, but the, they should be scaled up. Or else, there will be social conflict and social tension, and these people might become threats and risks, and they might be potential criminals. And these characteristics might spread to other areas and spheres of life in urban area. When we look at Western world, only just 20% of the migrant burden all Europe or all West in the face of 3.6 million population in Turkey, all Western countries have at most 1 million population of migrants. Therefore, this might be very simple at first glance, but the Gaziantep city, we have 400,000 Syrian migrants, and the population of the city is 1.5 million, an addition of 400,000 migrants all of a sudden. 
So it's not acceptable or it is something that you can make up with. It, we have to confess it and we all agree on this. It's a huge burden for Gaziantep city. Therefore, we demand more authorities for local governments and their operational capacities should be improved and the legal framework should be regulated and drafted and EU funds should be transferred taking this local authorities demands and needs into consideration. As local governors, local mayors, we wish all the best to our colleagues here. Thank you. Teşekkürler başkanım. Tabii en son bahsettiğiniz konudan eee so based on what you have just said, I would like to say a few things. You gave the example of Gaziantep, and that's the reason why we have placed this session here. We are talking about Gaziantep, and the numbers are now crisis level. And therefore, it is important to talk what the intermediaries can do. In the smaller cities, the management of migration is even more challenging, and there are problems related to integration as well. And it is easier to manage the problem, actually. So cooperation with the central governments is highly important, and maybe this problem could be solved with further support from the central governments, like in European countries. The next speaker is Murat Çalık from Beylikdüzü, Istanbul, and there is one thing I would like to say. It is a district in the periphery of Istanbul. It used to be considered that's as the outside of Istanbul, but the population in Istanbul has exceeded 15 million already, and therefore it's now part of this center as well. And Beylikdüzü district has prioritized the social inclusion projects considering the migrants and the citizens of uh, the district. So what would you say, Mr. Mayor, in this regard? I would like to welcome all the participants and all the members of the panel. No one would really like to leave their home for a random reason. For that reason, the matter of migration is not easy for the migrants and the host communities. The migrants experience social exclusion and the city which uh, receives the migration develops as well. And for that reason, the main duties of the city will be uh, problematic for the municipality in such as transportation or water and other services and Turkey is hosting the highest number of migrants for million migrants are hosted in our country this matter of asylum seeking is an agenda on the international arena but Turkey is left alone in terms of migrants and considering the economic input Turkey has been managing, has spent more than $35 billion. The Britain, with a population of 65 million people, hosts only 2,000 refugees. And in Kilis, we have 116,000 refugees living in Kilis. So the number of migrants in Kilis is almost six times bigger than the whole Britain. And this problem can only be say, solved um, with the participation of the local governments. With the civil war started in Syria, the migrant flux 
occurred and uh, Beylik Düzü municipality was also affected by this problem. We have 20,000 Syrian, Afghani, Iran, Iranian and uh, Turkmenistan refugees in Beylik Düzü. So in 2016, we started the Office of Migration Affairs and we started to provide the migrants with uh, food, uh, stationaries, and relevant uh, supplies. And we are also paying attention to schooling of these migrant children. In 2014, we initiated the child-friendly municipality understanding. And uh, in our children assemblies, the migrant children are also taking place. And with Walt Academy, we initiated our workshops for empowering the young girls. And the uh, young refugee girls are also included in such workshops now. Also, we signed a protocol with Walt and UNHCR. And we started our social protection office. And now we are providing the migrants with psychological services, legal assistance. And in the last 13 months, 1,924 refugees were provided with employment, education, and psychosocial support. And 63% of them, the women. Uh, and unfortunately, the women are not able to integrate to the social life, and they have experienced challenges with learning language. For that reason, we would like to make sure that more women should be included in our uh, language learning courses. And we also believe that the budget allocation should be done in the most proper way. In order to serve our own citizens, we are allocated a certain amount of budget by uh, the local, by the central government. But unfortunately, we have to use uh, the same budget for uh, the migrants as well. So this influx was called refugees, asylum seekers, people under temporary protection, our sisters, our brothers, our citizens. We called them in so many different ways. But I believe that we haven't been able to come up with the right description for such people. And with our understanding of considering those people as a guest, we couldn't really come up with a very clear policy. And the municipalities were left alone again during this process. The Turkish people welcomed the Syrians at the beginning. However, due to the long-lasting instability in Syria and economic crisis in our country in the recent years, this has now been questioned by our people. So actually now the people's livelihoods are being affected due to this crisis and local governments have to deal with them. So I believe we need a state policy at the macro level. A new vision is required. And unless we work towards the root cause of the problem, uh, we will not be able to render results out of our local activities. And according to the public opinion researches among our people, the biggest problem is still considered to be the Syrian migrants. So the governance and integration between the central government and local government should be very well handled. For example, in Germany, there are more than one million refugees who were accepted. And according to the data from 2018, the central government of Germany supported the local governments with a budget of 7.5 billion euros. So how did Germany cooperate with the local governments? That should be very well scrutinized. 
that should be very well researched. And as Beylik is a municipality, we are doing our best to decrease the tension amongst the people. And this needs to be clarified very well. How many of them are in Turkey? How many children are attending the schools? Where do they live? So this is highly important in order to utilize the funds. And as with the Republic of Turkey, these needs to be very well described at the international levels. So this is a supra-political thing, and this needs to be handled as a matter of the whole country. Unless you have this understanding, the social protection and uh, cohesion activities will not really result in tem uh, tem permanent results. So in order to ensure the welfare of the people, we will be doing our best and we will be working very hard. We want it to be the breath for Istanbul and we will maintain this effort and we will be doing our best to make sure that the migrants are integrated into the society. Thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you have this just mentioned, we are following up your activities in respect of social cohesion. It is important to decrease uh, the social uh, tension. It is not only about the people being involved in, in these uh, processes. The dialogue with the local people should be improved as much as possible. So your activities are quite important to us. We will be discussing about it later on. Uh, the municipality of Urla, Mayor. Mr. Brock, it is a district of Izmir. It is close to the central district of Izmir, and in, as, as an intermediary city, uh, we have been working with this district as well. And maybe Urla could have a different understanding of migrants because this is not a district of industry but a district of agriculture so their structure is very much different so we'll be talking about a different profile in terms of migration let's now listen to uh, the mayor I would like to express my happiness to be with you in a such important forum as is now migra migration is an event similar to the history of humanity Civilization was born due to migration and spread through migrations. The humanity moved between different geographies, crossed continents and oceans over many years. By the way, created various civilization and shaped history these geographies. Migrants, whether obligatory or voluntary, have created new opportunities for human beings and caused great suffering. Migration continues to shape our world today. In my speech today, I would like to pass the experience of Urla in the fight against migration movements. Our district, our district which also gives its name to the Urla Peninsula and is located in the western part of Anatolia. Our district, one of the settlements that have been subject to many migration movements through to history due to its geographical, geographical uh, position. What the differences Urla from other, other is its success in the struggle against these migration movements. Urla has been one of the rare places that can turn the problems created by these migration movements into opportunities and turn them into uh, cultural treasury. One of the most important factors that ena enable Urla to turn immigration movements into the opportunities is the con connect established by the people of Urla with the land. The people of Urla protect the land and benefit from its blessing as much as possible. In every wave of, every, every new wave of 
immigration from the land, the people of Urla directed the refugees to the land, made them love, made them love the land, and taught them benefit from its blessing. Urla has enriched by producing together with this new guest. Both in antiquity and after the Turks come to Anatolia, the nature of relationship established with the land has not changed. The large population movement, which initially seemed to be disadvantageous, result in the enrichment of Urla both culturally and economically each time. One of the most important indicator of the respect of the people of Urla, the land, is the house with gardens built with the understanding of horizontal arch architecture. Whatever the social status in this garden house, people of Urla enjoy the happiness of growing something in their garden and while they work on the land, make them happy and positive energy. You cannot see people fighting in the street of Urla. Urla was also very successful in dealing with the Syrian migration and it has largely eliminated their injuries with the opportunities it provides to Syrian refugees. Refugees, especially women and children, were provided with psychological support and social assistance. As Urla municipality, we study to provide service without difference between native and immigrant and, and so contribute and so contribute to social fusion. Whether there are no refugees in Urla who have to live or rest on the street. Actually, Urla is generally used crossing point to Greek Island and Europe via the agency. We put refugees up, met their needs, and set them back safely. As it is known, one of the problems migrants, immigrants face it, faces their adaptation of urban behavior patterns. The other is the integration problem. Integration is a difficult process in the metropolitan areas. However, in small cities, migration mobility can be managed correctly and migrants can able, uh, can able in the, uh, integration by spreading to a wide, wide geography. At this point, intermediate cities stand out as a shining cities should be brought to take, in, take, in, uh, account, take into account. Strategies need to be correctly. The experienced migration movement have brought together the culture of the immigration from far, far, far or near geographies and the culture of the settled people on the basis of the relationship established with the land. In this integration made the people of Urla more open minded and moderate. In this temperate climate, many uh, 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 philosophers philosopher and scientists and artists have grown since ancient time. Anaxagoras, Yorga Seferis, Necati Cumalı, Tanju Okan, Nezen Tevfik are the most well-known examples. As mentioned earlier, the basis of Urla's ability to handle migration movement is respect for the land and co-production. Local community have managed to make the land more productive and increase the product range by combining the skill of immigrants and with their own skills. Increasing production brought about the development of food and beverage culture and built the rich cuisine of Urla. Today, various of products of arti artichoke to pie from olive, the olive to fig from Milan to wine are known together with Urla. The several names of festival in Urla which formed by migration, Wine Yard Festival, Architok Festival, Melon Festival, Sea Festival. In the implementation of these strategies, the project and activities carried out by the local governments and undoubtedly at the forefront. All works in Urla qualities to be an example to Turkey. For example, we organized a search conference with the participation of agent of civil society organization in our district and we have set a roadmap for solution. While determining this roadmap, we have taken into account, uh, taken into consideration the criteria that will protect our culture and 
developed the local people. Again, between 1 and 3 November 2019, we organized the agriculture workshop with the Corporation of CHP General Center, Agriculture Forestry Business Union, and Izmir Metropolitan Municipality. We determined development strategies by the both city and our country. While defining these strategies, we tried to determine the, the measures that could be developed in terms of the internal and external migration, uh, migration towards, towards Urla. As a, as a result, no matter how big the immigration, disturbed and migration couldn't destroy the city's rich culture. Every new wave of migration has made Urla both economically and culturally rich. The main reason for, for this is that the people of Urla love the land and make them love the newcomers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We see a different detail in the example of Urla. The city has received the migrants historically, and you said it has always had uh, positive repercussions on you. And this is actually possible to be the case everywhere. Every city, every district uh, has the capacity to receive, to welcome the migrants. And Urla has always received a controlled and balanced migration. And uh, therefore, we can now talk about the concepts such as co-working, co-living. And this coordination between the local governments and central governments should be uh, enabled in this sense. Speaker for this session will be Ms. Firdaus Ositium from UCLG, and she is the coordinator of the Intermediate Cities Forum of UCLG, as I have said in the beginning. So I would like to hear her opinion from a global perspective on how intermediate cities can contribute and what potentials do they have with reference to the declarations that I've mentioned in the beginning, maybe. And you have been working with a lot of cities from all around the world, including Latin America and Europe, of course, and MEWA. So we'd like to hear your global perspective on this issue. Thank you, Salim. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, I would like. Thank you. Thank you. For my speech, I have kept the, the global, the general title of the conference, which is from emergency to resilience and development, actually, because for me, um, Intermediary cities are exactly this. It, they, have seen, they have been seen for a long time as secondary cities. They are, have been called in OECD as secondary cities. And since one year and something now, the, the narrative has changed. And this is very important because they are not secondary. They are really the future of our planet. So let's go quick. Voilà. I will go through three points. Uh, the fourth point will be the conclusion. But the most important uh, that I would like to, to, to transmit here is the fact that uh, everything comes from the local. We have been hearing local mayors, local experiences, local solutions. Um, so for us, it has been like a general process to take everything, experiences, uh, processes, um, solutions from the local and bring them to the global level. This is what we have done through a general consultation like you were saying right now, uh, Salem. Uh, we have been for one year and a half turning around the different continents, listening to mayors. Even today, uh, each time we hear a mayor, we know there is an experience behind, we know there is stories behind individuals, generals, a vision, sometimes like uh, the mayor was, was presenting as well. So what we have done is to see how we can systemize this kind of experiences and bring them to a global level. And this is what we have done as the first step. The second step was what did we do towards migration? And the third point is about from global to local again. Why do we have to go through the global? To bring down systemized and scaled up solutions and make them for a larger uh, number of cities and citizens as well, because this is the end of the whole work we are doing, citizens' uh, well-being. 
Um, so let's go quick. The first one, what, what we have done through the consultation, is to generate at the end a charter for the intermediary cities of the world um, with how they have been implementing the global agendas. And uh, from Middle East and Mewa, we had the declaration uh, that was strong, very strong focused on migration because it is a key problem here. Uh, so it is one of the, of the, of the added value that uh, the, our section Mewa did bring to, to, the, to the charters. Um, how is uh, migration touched in intermediary cities? Let's go to the second point. There are, here we have just general uh, frames. Every one of the words that you see there are not UCLG words, not UCLG principles, they could be. But each of those words are words that went out from the local, went out from the mayors and went out our results, as the results of the consultation. So multi-level dialogue as a regulatory mechanism is something that came from the cities. They are asking for more complementarity from the national level. Uh, the human values at the heart and core of every of the actions, solidarity, and of course, uh, the economy uh, as being part of the integration and shock absorbers. Uh, intermediary cities are shock absorbers for the migration and, and flushes. The strongest message that we kept is please, let's invest in the human capital. This is if I want to make only one sentence on everything, it's this one. Investments must be on human capital. It's not about who they are coming from or where they are coming from, who they are, and I think the Vice President of the Republic yesterday said that. It's not about religion, it's not about who they come from, the gender, whatever they are. Human capital, they are, and it is a question of humanity. So, uh, economy, participatory, listening to the cities, listening to citizens. But at the end of the day, it is really the message of talking about the human values and the human being. The third point, uh, when we go uh, from the global now to the local, it has to be done through our experiences through the national level. There is no other secret for us for intermediary cities. Why? Because in the world, uh, we have more than 30,000 uh, 30, intermediary cities. While in Morocco, my home country, we would have an intermediary city for 50,000 inhabitants. In China, an intermediary city is already four or five million inhabitants. So it is really relative and correspondent to, to the country um, scales. Uh, what we have done as experience, as a concrete experience, is in Morocco, uh, from UCLG to sign an agreement, an MOU between UCLG World Secretariat, UN Habitat, a UN agency, and the government of Morocco for a national strategy on intermediary cities to ground back and localize SDGs and all the problems of, uh, of, uh, that the intermediary cities can find when implementing the global agendas. And between them, I'm coming from a city, my home city is Tangier. I'm based in Barcelona, but my home city is Tangier. It is the northest point of Africa, and this is exactly where all uh, Africans coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Algeria, from Morocco, from, are going through this point to go to try to migrate to Spain. And we have... Um, uh, I can't find the words, but it, we, each morning we can find people that have lost their life trying to cross 11 kilometers of sea just to find out an Eldorado they, they're not sure they will find, but they have put all their resources for that. All what they had, they put it in, arriving to Tangier and crossing. And, and, and many of the times they... they they are lost in the intent. But it's something that we know from Tangier, we have experienced this. And um, so for Morocco, we were proposing intermediary cities, uh, and it is part of the national strategy that is being developed, to have the intermediary cities as shock absorb absorbers of all these people that cannot cross anymore, and they stay in Morocco with problems of 
housing problems of uh, integration problems of env uh, environment and and all what this complexity we were talking about this morning uh, so now we 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 are working with the the government to through the implementation of the SDGs to allow development and generate a resilience for the intermediary cities through the question of migration as well. To not be a problem, but to change the narrative as being something positive, as being something that will help intermediary cities in bringing development and enhancing uh, the question of governance, the question of scales, uh, proximity, etc., etc. So. Uh, we had uh, the government of Spain asking for the same experience um, in their intermediary cities because the intermediary cities in Spain are losing their people. So they came to, to, to Morocco asking for cooperation and we have many countries coming in this solution uh, as, as a urban tool. Um, just to close, uh, and that was the fourth point. From UCLG, we have uh, launched and ac adopted the, the Declaration of Humankind Rights for the Resilience. And for us, migration is also a question of resilience. It is a universal movement. It is a timeless movement. It is not today. It is not yesterday. It is always. It is just the human life that is like that, uh, looking for better uh, environments, for better conditions, for their children, for the future. So for us, it is a question of intergenerational responsibility, equity, dignity, but also continuity. Continuity because it is a question of policy. It is a continuity at local level. Life continues, but the policies and the human action uh, must, must, uh, must, uh, must follow that. And just to close, um, we, we have to keep in mind that we will be made accountable for each of our actions today, in the future. And this is why migration is also a question of resilience. Um, tomorrow, chil our children will be telling us why you didn't take the right decision at that moment. And we are at this moment, and we have to take the right decision. And in this whole uh, 30,000 urban tool that are intermediary cities, there are the unique potential for the global resilience. Thank you very much. So thank you, Firdaus, for this powerful speech. Uh, I would like to take one point out of your speech in particular. The, the national strategy on intermediate cities in Morocco, that is something very important for us. Uh, the 2018 forum was held in Shawshawan. I think it was, it helped you to cooperate with the national government of Morocco. And if we can organize the same forum in 2020 in Turkey, I think it can help us to mobilize the government in Turkey as well as other stakeholders to, to push the government actually to uh, do something similar in Turkey, and we have other partners. Union of Municipalities of Turkey is here, which is a partner of this organization, of course. We have the Secretary General of Union of Marmara Municipalities. If we can combine and create a unified voice in that regard, it can help. And we really believe in Turkey, especially, it can make a difference in terms of not only migration management, but also, as you said, the resilience of the cities. So thank you for all the speakers of the session. We can go for questions. We can go with questions, but before I would like to ask a, a, a generic question to all the mayors who are here. Maybe we, then we can go with the questions from the ground. So as a panelist of this forum, of this, uh, of this session especially, you all do something particular on migration management and you are all uh, refugee friendly mayors by definition because you are here you are here to contribute and you are here to focus on your activities or present your activities in migration but uh, as the mayors of small and small and intermediate cities you have maybe closer contact with your population the local population because by definition you are supposed to be more maybe engaged than a metropolitan mayor who may not have 
enough time to engage with much of its constitu constituency. So in that regard, I would like to ask uh, what kind of challenges you have among the local populations, because it's not always easy to focus on the migrants, but not the local population. You are focusing simultaneously, but it may not be the general understanding of your local population. We are hearing some incidents in some cities that if mayor is doing so much on migrants, then the local population may, may not like it, or the, the policy may backfire. So some social inclusion policy policies may not be very productive. I would like to know from each of you, how do you handle this challenge and how do you, uh, how do you make your local population understand what you are doing is actually for the benefit of the whole? Maybe we can start with you and then we can continue. Please. Bueno, desde mi punto de vista, el principal problema es el de... According to my point of view, what matters here is how you tell the narrative, the story, how you tell the story, the narrative matters. If there is an increasing, uh, rising tide wave of xenophobia in Europe and Spain also, somehow it also spread to Europe. When you have, previously we didn't have extreme right uh, political party, but now we have in parliament and they have 50 deputies. Therefore, the gr ma main challenge is to fight against this discourse, political discourse, xenophobia. There is no more resources for migrants or refugees. No, that is not. It is not true that migrants receive more financial resources than the host community. It's the same, but there are active policies about health, education, and employment. But it's the same for all citizens. The distribution of resources is same and equal. It, is, it doesn't depend on the location of the migrants. We have internal domestic migrants. They move throughout the year. The seasonal families, they have full rights of the residents of the city. We talk about people. We are not talking about nationalities. The discourse is very important. The narrative is important. The others are not coming to capture your job and your space and your place. This narrative is misleading, and it's not true. Economic terms, they might be supported additionally, but those uh, demanding this employment, but what the main problem is how you develop arguments and how you develop, shape your story and narrative. I may conclude, according to my point of view, is the major challenge is employment. Municipalities and cities like me, if you have 20% unemployment already, then I can develop this discourse. This employment issue can be a negative element of the discourse, but you should have decisions. The mayors of the cities somehow, if we tell this convincingly that this is about human rights and civil rights, basic rights, then the residents of the city as not the nationalities, but the residents of the city. If we have this discourse, then this negative, racist, and xenophobic discourse will be supported. As my point of view, this is the major challenge, the narrative and the story, and how you shape and develop it. For his response to this question. It's, of course, a key question, and uh, of course, we need uh, narratives. If we are looking back to the history, for example, in Europe, uh, we, we see that uh, in history, all towns develop better by opening their walls to foreigners who have had needs at these moments. I can bring example over example, and you have to tell this to your citizens all the time, but a mayor is not enough for a mayoress uh, because we are only one person in a middle-sized town and we can't, can't do something without the, the civil society. So you, you, you have to bring the narrative inside the heart of the civil society. This is in my eyes the key point. 
if you, if you reach the hearts of the people, you will win elections, but this is not important in this case. You will bring the narrative to the hearts, and I think this is uh, necessary, to show images like we saw in the morning, every time, and it's like a wake-up call in the morning. You don't like this reality, but you have to deal with. And I think uh, the people at the front, volunteers who are engaged in the, in the process of integration, can build a bridge, a uh, huge and a very strong bridge. They are a little bit like uh, ambassadors. And uh, they, of course, there are fears in every, every town if there are coming people from abroad with different culture, with different religion, with different uh, um, behavior. And uh, the writers in Europe are using this storytelling now to create fear. And we have to stand against this fear. We have to bring another story, another narrative. Uh, in Germany, for example, now 40% of the migrants or come, uh, who came uh, to Germany between 2014 and 2016 have jobs, regular jobs. This is a narrative you have to tell again and again. It's an economic question. We have a dem demographic change because in Western Europe we have not enough women. Uh, and uh, the people who are coming to us are very young. They are potentials for the, for the future of our societies. Uh, this narrative is uh, responsible. But you also need to, be, uh, to have courage because uh, without this it's not possible and you shouldn't be a mayor without courage. And I saw it in, in my person, I was uh, in 2017, ex exact on this day, I have my, my birthday today, I was attacked with a knife because uh, of the policy I did. But uh, what kind of politicians we like, not politicians who are hiding, you have to bring your face to the customer, your face to the civil society, and to stand up against racism and xenophobia. I think this is our duty worldwide, and uh, mayors and mayoress have to stand this. And I think strong mayors and strong mayors are very often to be found in medium-sized cities. And to be a mayor in a, in a huge city, it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes a little bit easier than, than to, to, to stand the pressure, the direct pressure of people in your town. And uh, I think we are in a good way, not at the end, definitely, because many mayors don't see this like we are seeing, seeing the problem from with our eyes in this morning, but our, our potential is growing and we have to work with narratives to, to, to let it grow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I said in this size of cities, it's always easier to get in the closer contact by definition. But your experience was something extreme, of course. But we are glad that you are here, safe and sound. And yes, we can continue with Mayor of Gebze, Mr. Zinur Bikos, for his comments. Thank you. As mentioned by my Spanish colleague, the employment problem is always lying in the heart of such big problems in the democratic countries. The social patterns might be ignored and the humanitarian values might be ignored and they might be used as a political tool. And unfortunately, in our country, we also experience the same. When we face our citizens, they always say that the Syrians are given all the facilities of our country and uh, they are given salaries despite uh, the fact that they are not working. But that is not true in our country either. We are in office 
at the local governments according to the laws of uh, Turkish Republic. And if the person is not registered with your district, you can't really give them anything. And we are not actually offering them any service directly. We mostly do it through the NGOs. And as the Turkish people, uh, we are very tender. And at the beginning, the people thought that uh, the resources are allocated to the Syrian. But later, they could easily apologize when they learn about the truth. So they would not put their benefits at the forefront. And so basically, if there was no problem with employment, the people of our country would uh, really not complain about such a thing, because our cultural and social structure would not really allow it. So this is the responsibility of ours, we believe. And as discussed by my Spanish colleague, the employment problem is always the basis of such problems. And they could easily be used for political purposes. And the society is really confused. And some political turmoils are caused this way. So there might be different political attempts in this regard. And we tell the people about the facts. For example, yesterday, I did one thing. I have the Council of People. We have 40 neighborhoods, and each we have people's council in each neighborhood. And yesterday, around 400 people took place in uh, our neighborhood council. And they said that uh, our facilities are given to the Syrian. But I told them about the facts. And the same people asked me if they could also donate. So the local administrators should actually understand the expectations of the community well enough and should be more careful about their actions that they will take. So according to the differences in perception in each neighborhood, we go there with their expected discourses because some of the neighborhoods are urbanized due to their structure. Some might have other differences due to their ethnicities. So depending on the structure of each neighborhood, we would provide them with the, the relevant feedbacks and that will not cause any major problem. Our approach is that we love the created due to the creator. So regardless of one's ethnicity or religion, we always consider them as beloved people. And we do our best effort to provide them with the relevant facilities. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You are actually using the advantage from the urban scale, so you can easily eliminate uh, such problems. Thank you for your comments. And I would like to give the floor to Murat Bey, the mayor of Beylik Tuzu district. Well, thank you. Actually, Turkey has a different situation. It should be handled differently in the recent years. We have been hosting the Syrian refugees, and we should have a humanitarian understanding. We have responsibilities. We also have responsibilities for the future generations. And if we are unable to harmonize it at the city level, if we are unable to come up with solutions to such problems, then the future generations will be more challenged than us in terms of coming up with solutions to such problems. So 
I would say that we should have a humanitarian understanding for this problem. The challenge that we experience is, is that we already have our own internal migration in our country. The internal migration movements are still the case. And I am the mayor of a district with 350,000 population. And the movement in the last five years is again around 100,000. And we have been hosting around 20,000 refugees in our district. Esenyurt is uh, the neighboring district. They have almost 1 million population. And they are hosting 100,000 refugees. So it should actually be considered as a matter of our country. I agree with uh, Zinur. We should not consider it as a political thing. This is supra-political and beyond politics. Turkey should first develop its policies at the country level, and they should empower and authorize the local governments accordingly. So we are actually trying to produce some services in areas we are not even authorized to. So we are allocated a certain amount of budget by the central government, and we are serving all the people with those facilities allocated to us. It is all about employment and economy again. The marginal industries develop in our region, and we have to embrace the challenges that come with those. So. I believe that it should be very well clarified. No one would like to become a refugee. No one would really wish to leave their homeland for obligatory reasons. What matters is to make sure that those people live peacefully in their own lands. And that should be considered at a global scale. And we should uh, try to understand why these term oils are never stopping in the Middle East. So the political actors should actually make sure that peace is brought to the Middle East. I claim no one, no single person would really like to leave the land they belong to. No one would really like to live as an asylum seeker in any other place because you are not able to feel that you belong to such a places. And we would like to do this integration with the children. We had this children's assembly that we created and we are encouraging the refugee children also to take place in such assemblies because the children might have a humanly understanding of the case. Uh, they are not like us. Uh, we might have other agendas and so we might think of them in a very different way, but uh, they would think of it in a more humanly way and I believe the integration will be possible with the children. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When we remove it from the political context and place it in a human context, they could easily be overcome, as you said. And. I would like to hear from Brak Bay with respect to Urla municipality. As mentioned by the other mayors and the participants, it is actually all about the employment and social rights. As the local administrators, while sharing the facilities that we have, we should always take into consideration the citizens of our region. 
So when we start to share our scarce resource with the other refugees, some conflicts might emerge. We might be talking about the Syrian refugees, but not only this Syrian refugees, we might also receive qualified migrants. So what do we do at Urla level in order to prevent such conflicts? We welcome the refugees and without any discrimination am amongst them, we are doing our best to guide them. So in order not to conflict, in order not to cause any conflict among the local people, they should be supported economically. And for this purpose, we bring together the local pro producers. I talked about the land and we encourage them to set up cooperatives and we are supporting them as the local government. The local people do not experience any loss and they, the income actually increases with our support and this way they can easily tolerate our support for the refugees and we also protect the local people with our available facilities and this way the conflict is minimized. The biggest problem is about employment and this is the case not only in Urla or in Izmir but it is the case in the entire world. As long as you support the local people these conflicts could be minimized easily. So without causing any perception of a positive discrimination for the local, for the refugees, it is possible. Now we might proceed to the Q&A session. Um, hello, my name is Zaina Nazer from Cities Forum UK, um, and I'm also a volunteer with uh, UCLG. My question is for Dr. Andreas Holstein. I would like to thank you for a wonderful presentation. So for the, the last two days, I think I will only remember your presentation because um, uh, you say you're a small mayor, but you made a great impact. And um, I do agree with the master of ceremony um, that um, you know myself as a consultant and project manager, you need a budget for, for uh, the refugees. However, you didn't need a budget to organize the volunteers. So as my experience as volunteer in the UK where I'm based, um, so they do integrate, so no comment, they're doing great job with, with Syrian immigrants. However, for one family, you might find 60 volunteers. So probably it's a little bit too much. I lived a few years ago in Luxembourg, and this is how I relate to your experience. And it was in, in fact the opposite. So I tried to volunteer and I was not welcome. My, my services were not welcome. I saw the way they live. They put them in a, a left over like a deserted uh, government building. And I feel the way they, they, I mean, seriously, I met with a lot of these Syrians informally because I was not allowed to go inside the building. So I had to wait outside. I just was so concerned about them. And they were like, so sad that some people were so lucky to go to Germany or to the UK. So they were the unlucky people who went to Luxembourg. So uh, nothing against Luxembourg, but what I want to say, uh, the message I want to, to give basically is, I would love to see your model, like you as coming, going to different cities in Europe and presenting your model. And don't underestimate, even if you're a small city, you made a great impact. And I believe small cities have more impact now than large cities. So I would love to hear from you in Geneva to talk about your example for others to learn about what you can do. I have great examples of Syrian refugees in the UK who got scholarship in Oxford in, in PhD. So these guys, they are like us. I mean, I'm British now, and with Brexit, I might become migrant and come to Germany, and I need your help. So, so, so basically what I want to say is I would love to hear more from your stories, um, your example, and if you can guide 
in Europe. I don't know about migrant or, or refugees experience in the Middle East because I haven't experienced it myself as a volunteer, but as a volunteer in Europe, I can see that your example is fantastic and I love to hear more about your example um, for the rest of European cities. Um, thank you for your nice words, but uh, we have to, to take in mind that uh, Europe is very different. We see it with Brexit, of course. Um, one question, perhaps why, uh, I don't know the situation in Luxembourg, I might be not very um, keen in, in answer this, but uh, it depends to the, to the uh, money. Everywhere in the richer part of Europe where money is ruling, Nobody is taking care about the, the situation and the opportunities volunteers have. And in my town, it was not a development of, uh, of the refugee crisis or uh, the migrant, um, a reflection to the migrant situation. It was at the beginning, a start, uh, how citizens in a smaller town can be useful for their own um, success by giving something to others, younger to older people, older to younger people, um, and uh, there they created their own. I'm, I'm only the framework. I put my hands over this idea, but uh, I, I did not uh, wrote a very good uh, paper how it should be done, but it developed step by step from bottom up and not from top down. And we have the problem that politics all over the world is thinking top down. And we need a bottom up approach, a bottom up approach uh, from, from, uh, from uh, such things like refugee crisis not be solved by Chancellor Merkel and other leaders in Europe or worldwide, or uh, uh, Trump is, uh, is solving nothing. Uh, that example. Um, other leaders in, in Latin America, I would say, uh, the, the, the citizens themselves are bringing solutions and bringing opportunities and bringing experience. And you can cr integrate uh, the second migration generation also in this process. It's not without problems, but it's working. And if you are interested to, to read more, we have had uh, the opportunity in 2016 that the OECD was uh, doing a report on uh, cities in Europe uh, and uh, in, in, in the case of migration. And uh, there was Paris in, of course, there was Barcelona in, of course, there was Berlin in, of course, but we got in these big ships too, so small Altena, uh, is uh, in this OECD study, and you can read it on internet. And uh, I have two two, uh, two parts with me, but not for all. But if you are interested in the story of Altena, is one example. There are lots of more examples in Europe. I know many colleagues are doing great work, and uh, but I think we have to spread this narrative too that mayors can be and mayoresses can be successful by dealing in a good quality with their citizens with this question. It's not only a question of money. Money alone can solve nothing. Even in, in, in rich Germany where every uh, migrant would like to, to live uh, scenes from the, from the mobiles and the stories they, they read there, um, it's a framework, you need it. The colleagues of Turkey know it, it's hard uh, to host such a huge number of, of refugees, but uh, integration you can only do by involving your citizens. Thank you, Mr. Mir. Uh, just a few those, I think had some additional comments which I couldn't catch for the previous question. Thank Please. you, Salim, yes. Uh, it is always, for us, uh, from UCLG, it's always a big pleasure to listen to, to, to the mayors because we come from, from them, and without them there will be no uh, 
policies, no understanding from, from the reality of the ground. Uh, uh, for, for Europe, I just would like to say that the intermediary cities in Europe, are, the work we are doing with them, and the Forum in Europe did uh, concentrate a lot on ensuring social cohesion, which is the key thing. And you are right, uh, resources and money, it's not everything. Uh, sometimes we know about intermediary cities that uh, many of them have a lack of resource, financial resources, but a big human capital resources, and they do a lot with it, even with, although it's not, without it, we cannot do anything as well, <laughs> but it is like a question of creativity. Now, I just wanted to, to go back to say, after listening to um, um, Billy Kuzu, Billy Kuzu and, and also Urla, which I know very well, and um, a territory which I'm in love with, um, Urla is an example of what tomorrow cities that have received migration could be as a successful experience. Uh, and, and they are in it. They have developed things and they have uh, today a richness in the city where only life is the key thing to work for and to work with. And I think it is, it is something that should be scaled up and, and, and many of these examples uh, should be scaled up as, as Athena as well. Um, but the question is for me, and in this session, it is important to focus on the fact that we are talking about governance, and governance is one. Whether it is local, whether it is regional, whether it is national, governance is one because we are in this state of emergency today. It has been declared as such by the Secretary General of the Nation, of United Nations. <clears throat> Sorry. So, and as one, as one governance, we, we, we have to think as one humanity and as a complementarity to make all these policies, all these values, all these principles, something operational. We are not talking only about abstract things. Uh, we, we, we are talking about how to make it operational and how to make it co-operational between all the different levels of governance. And this is what I wanted to, to insist on. And of course, we will be having the second World Forum of Intermediary Cities in Turkey. Uh, I'm very happy about that. And um, the person we did sign it from UN Habitat was coming from UNDP, Zena Ali Ahmed, and she went back to UNDP Iraq. Uh, and she had a UNDP state of mind, and this is made us made the whole thing very easy. So we invite any, any, any support in this way for Turkey and for Mewa to work with. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I see many hands and I have some questions in my hand, but I just need to ask if you have several more minutes. Okay. We need to be very quick. Please. And then you. Maybe we can collect the questions together and try to. I have, sorry, uh, Arzum Karasu from the World Food Program. I have two very quick questions. First is for Mr. Holstein. You mentioned in your speech that uh, you are providing or you have provided language classes to migrants or um, uh, refugees. Were these compulsory or not? Th th your answer will actually shape my second question to a Turkish mayor. Uh, they are in Germany now uh, comprehensive, you have to do it, but um, in back to the 20, uh, situation in 2014 there were, they were not, and not everyone can take part in, so only if you have a opportunity with, uh, that you probably stay in Germany you can use them. Mm -hmm. And therefore we have had the, 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 imp the big impact of the uh, volunteer language courses and they were quite on a, on a high level and we worked together with, with new technique, for, exam, for example the uh, Liechtenstein language uh, technique, uh, it's a technique uh, not to learn written language, German language, uh, you can learn the language by gaming and uh, other things and only to, to have the first tools uh, to, to be in a better situation if you come new to a country where you don't know a word of the language. 
Thank you. Um, My second question will be the Turkish mayors, social cohesion and integration, talking about unemployment. The important factor is language barrier. Here in Turkey, some European countries, the practices, language courses are mandatory. Language courses became mandatory in some European countries. In the ninth uh, year of Syrian crisis in Turkey, we still, these language courses and language trainings, we have challenges, uh, non-participation or non-attendance are difficult to, to encourage people to participate language trainings here in Turkey. In your perspective, what are the main reasons for this unwillingness and what should be done to address this need to eliminate language barrier? We'll have the second question, too. There is a lady who wants to say on the front row, please. Microphone, excuse me. Gül Erdost, my name, UNFPA, United Nations Fund Population. I'm a women empowerment expert. And we have many centers on the field, and we work on sexual and reproductive health and women empowerment and gender equality activities in our centers. Thank you very much to the speakers of the session. I, we need some concrete proposals, concrete suggestions to solve a very complex problem. For instance, in Germany, this fostering family, godfather and godmother's mentoring issue in Germany practice is very striking. This is very practical and can be spread. And Beylik, this uh, children's councils, especially for social harmonization, the Beylik is a practice including and involving refugee children in their children's councils is very relevant and important. For social cohesion, we are focusing mostly on the integration and harmonization of refugees. This is not proper indeed. The host communities' harmonization and increasing their awareness, the host community awareness and harmonization. The mayors, speaking from Turkey, when they come face to face with their electorates, the host community harmonization in the context and framework of human rights and awareness raising activities for human rights and uh, fighting against discrimination. I believe we need further awareness raising activities for host community. As I'm a women empowerment expert, I couldn't hear too much specific proposals or practices for women. Just in Beylik Tuzu figures, I have seen some. Women activities, increasing women participation and awareness. What are, we need your suggestions, your proposals about women involvement. Due to gender roles, women are confined to their homes. They are secluded and have barriers to participate in social life. What are your suggestions? What are your proposals for women empowerment and including women in social life? The third and the last question Maybe later on we will have comments from the mayors for each question. I'm country director of Oxfam in Turkey. I must say I am humbled with the energy and experience and knowledge and intervention each of you are bringing to the field. And thank you very much for everything you are doing. Uh, I see there, is, there are few issues in the municipalities' engagement and also the... the uh, uh, one is a more equitable distribution of services within the, the country itself, the nation itself, and uh, equitable uh, uh, distribution. Uh, and then the other issue is the equitable inter, uh, responsibility sharing internationally. And I heard some suggestions for national level equitable responsibility sharing and what can be done on that issue uh, from budget to non-politization uh, non of refugee issues, putting emphasis to humanity, etc. I am wondering what can you as a group of mayors suggest uh, for leveraging international responsibility sharing and for making 
in the national responsibility sharing more equitable? What can you bring to the field with collaboration among your staff? I have some questions about women issue. The next parallel session will be on local governments and women refugees. Maybe we can spare it for next session. The language issue and the host community integration, these two questions, the language issue and the host community integration, we will answer. A volunteer mayor will have the floor. Now, while preparing our presentations, we were given 20 minutes, but we could not go into the details of the figures due to time limitation. For instance, in Gebze, for children at the school age, we have a 92% schooling percentage. 92% of refugee children are attending the school in Gebze. And for individuals below the age of 40, among individuals under 40, we have 60% language proficiency. We have only need for improvement, and we have challenges for the individuals about the age of 40. And their main psychological approach is the war will end soon, and we will get back to return back to our country. And now at this our late age, they don't need they don't have a need to learn a new language but for individuals under the age of 40 they have more willingness to learn and we have GESMEC vocational and language uh, and cultural activities courses GESMEC is an institution of Gebze municipality and they have courses trainings for arts music painting and sculpture they have a training center for social activities and training and in this GESMEC center 90% of participants are women. And among these women, we see the women of uh, refugee or migrant families so that they develop their handcraft skills and they make a contribution to household budget. And we further encourage language learning through these GESMEC centers. Therefore, the infrastructure that we create for them is not just for assistance or basic needs such as accommodation. It's not limited to providing assistance. In the streets, they, they are no longer perceived as a foreigner in the streets. They are a natural and essential member of the society. They can walk in the streets freely. They can do shopping at the local market, and they can express themselves. But only, as I said, for individuals about the age of 40, they have reluctance. And the main psychological uh, barrier is the war will end soon, and they will get back to Syria. This expectation, they are unwilling because of this. In creating solutions, the local governments are fulfilling their active role and no doubts for that. Thanks. Uh, I will make a concrete suggestion, a concrete proposal, both for UCLG officials and representatives of UN. First, we all ha live in a district, and we are mayors of these districts, and we have migrants there, but we don't know their profile, their educational status, economical status. Therefore, if we want to go into deep inside this, it is not just statistical comparison is not enough to solve. It is 2,000 people, 100,000 people. You can solve it with just statistics. They already experienced the trauma on the road during the migration. And when you add up economic challenges, the profile traveling and making to Europe and those staying in Turkey, there is a huge difference. But we don't have a data available yet. But my conclusion about this difference of profile, the 20,000 in our district and those 20, 100,000 in Esenyur, the district of Istanbul, they have different economic levels. Those with lo lower economic status prefer to go Esenyur. And those in our uh, district, they are not very high qualified migrants, but comparatively better off. Therefore, in a one apartment flat, two or three families live together and share the same apartment flat. So if you cannot solve their problems or if you do not have a profile assessment of the refugees and migrants in your city, 
the assistance and the programs for 20,000 people in a European city and the assistance and the services for 20,000 people in Turkey. You have to conduct a careful profile assessment and so that it will be tailor-made solutions based on your profile assessments. I'm a city planner by profession. First you analyze the baseline and the needs assessment. Later on you develop solutions and the projections for that. Now we still don't fully understand what we face in terms of the profiles of these migrants. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have exceeded well beyond our time. Briefly, I will summarize the outcomes of this session. Thanks to this session, we hope that these small cities and intermediary cities significance for migration policies and development policies has been emphasized. The mayor's personally stated here, this size cities has initiative to take active role for migration management. They are well aware of their potential, but the national governments and international institutions support is needed. So not just financial support. It is also it also covers political and policy supports of national governments and international organizations. And these scale cities and uh, intermediary cities, through their empowerment, a more balanced migrant distribution will contribute to minimizing the escalations. These are the main messages of this session. Thank you very much for your attention, and my thanks and appreciation goes to each and every speaker of this session. Thank you.